اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا ومولانا وشفعينا وحبيبنا محمد طه ياسين آمين خاتم النبيين المرسل رحمة للعالمين مدرب العالمين صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم سلام على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وجميع ملائكة المقربين وأيضا أهل الكسر وأهل البيت الكرام وأصحابه مخلصين وتبعين متبعيهم وأولياء الله الصالحين وعلم المتقين وشهداء المتحرين وجامع مشايخنا ومرابنا ومشيدنا إلى الله تعالى سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام على المسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين رب يشرح لي صدري ويسير لي أمري وحلول لقطة من لساني يفكه كولي وأما بعد سبحان الله Uh, this is uh, now, uh, these things that we spoke about last night, uh, you can see that they provoke a lot of uh, reaction from people. So the official view on this, these matters, all that had to do with the will, with the election, with the selection, with Fatak, with all of these things, these have become dividing points uh, or d divisive issues for the community. So the official view on all of this is that our duty is to be silent regarding this and all disputes between the companions, radiallahu ta'ala on whom, and to have a good opinion of all of them, and that these differences did not occur due to selfish desires or to caprices, but rather through each of them exercising their own independent judgment, ijtihad. And in fact, Al-Ghazali, radiallahu ta'ala an, uh, counted such talk uh, to be from uh, careless, sinful talk, where it's called khawd fil batil in Arabic. And in his ihya, he said that this was sinful talk. So the best thing is to have a good opinion of everybody and understand that all of them were doing what they thought was the right thing to do. But nevertheless, these were the facts of what happened. Now, what we can say is that these last six months of the life of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, after the death of her father, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, were extremely sad sad in a way that I don't think any of us can even imagine and filled with much vexation at many many different levels not at least the least of which was the political disunity of the Ummah which came from that. And you see that the genius of the Prophet was that he was able to keep very disparate people like say the ones that I'd like to mention you know as Abu Dhar and, and Uthman radiallahu ta'ala an Uma, uh, one of which was you know almost like a communist or a socialist you know and very extreme in, in terms of his uh, the, the, the poverty under which he lived the voluntary poverty under which he lived and the other was a very rich man but both of them worked in the cause of uh, Allah and the Prophet was able to keep them working together. When his presence was gone from the community, the disunity and these differences between the people became more apparent than they ever had been. And so there were glaring differences between the people and old things that existed between people came up and rose up and so on and so forth. It was a really a very, uh, very difficult time and problems between the the, the Ansar and the, the people who had uh, made the uh, Hijra yeah, and uh, all of these things came to the f were boiling under the surface or even came to the forefront. In any case, the final thing of it is, was what the Prophet had told her, which made her laugh, which is that she would be the first person to join him. And she got to the point where she died. And as 
as in her life, so it was in her death. And there are many different stories from different sides concerning and uh, surrounding her and what happened. But the most widely accepted one is that on the morning of her death, she made ghuzl, she took a bath, she put on all new clothes and lay down on her bed. And then she asked for Ali, uh, salam, and informed him that it was her time to die and it was very close. And he himself began to cry. But she consoled him. And this reminds me of my own mother. That when my own mother was about to die, maybe three hours before she died, I was very, very concerned, needless to say, that my mother was dying. But my mother was a, a, a great believer, and she looked me in the eye and she said, Son, what are you worried about? There's nothing to be worried about. Nothing to worry about. And she tried to put me at rest and ease. And this is, uh, you know, people who have strong belief are like that. So she told this to Ali, alayhi salam, and consoled him and told him about things that had to happen, looking after her two sons, and that she wanted to be buried without any ceremony. Any, what I mean by ceremony is any pomp or any big thing where there were a lot of people and so on and so forth like that. And after her death, uh, salam, uh, Ali uh, followed her wishes and buried her. And without informing the people of Medina, which is just as she had asked, not to allow the people that, who she felt were her oppressors to be involved in her janazah or to take any part in the burial. Her two sons, uh, Hassan and Hussein, uh, salam, were the first of the members of the family to learn of her death after Ali. Uh, I mean, even actually before, when she actually died, and went to the masjid where he was to inform their father who came. And then, when eyes were asleep, yani in the night, and voices were silent, a heavenly procession left that holy house. And Hassan and Hussein, Zainab, Um Kutum, walked quietly behind their beloved mother, and uh, their father Ali and a few close friends carried the daughter of Fatima Zahra to her final resting place. And Ali, according to the wishes of Fatima, performed the Salat al Janaza and buried her. And he made three false graves in different places so that her true grave would never be known, and it's never known to this day. Nobody knows exactly where Fatima is buried, alayhi salam. In the lilahi, wa in alayhi rajimun, Allah says in Surah Baqarah, we are from Allah, and to Him we return. So, all of this in these nights of which we've been talking about this, I tried to relate this story in an as even-handed manner as possible, knowing that there are tremendous differences in our community about different aspects and different parts of these things. But when Allah says of us, Ummatan Wasatan, this is Ummatan Wasatan, you are the people of the middle. We Sufi people, we, this is what we aspire to be, the people of the middle. We give everybody their due, we're respectful to everybody, we don't curse anybody. You know, in the, in the words that were on the flag uh, 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 of Zariba uh, Nawaz, Moinuddin Shishti, he says, with love for all and malice towards none. This is the way of the Sufiya. So all of these people, with all of these were all Sahabas, and each of them had their thing, and they were all human beings. So we try to maintain a position of respect towards all of them and to occupy this middle position that Allah spoke about, Ummat and Wasatan, which also means uh, Ummatan of the heart, because the Wasat is also a, a meaning of the word Wasat in Arabic, in, in Lisan al Arabi, in the tongue of the Arab, means not only the middle of things, like we say Wasat al Balad means midtown, for instance, in, in 
Logot al Arabiya, or the language of the Arab, but Wasatan in the Lisan al Arab also refers that to the heart, because the heart is the center of our beings. So all of this really is only an outline, even with all of this detail, of the story of the life of Fatima al Zahra. Salam, and the daughter of the Prophet salam, the wife of Ali salam, and the mother of Hassan and Hussein and Zainab and Umm Kutum uh, salam. And in reality she was a mother to all believers she is a mother to all of us and she's a mother especially to those people who are the lovers of al Bayt, uh, which I hope to be uh, accounted for be one of those people who are the lovers of al -Hubay. And I only have, you know, as I, when I was writing this, I know I only have a brief time left, so I want to just to talk about a very important point in the conclusion of this talk. And this is, the, I call this talk Fatima Az-Zahra Majmu Nurain. This means, this Majmu Nurain means the meeting point or the confluence of the two lights. And I think of these two lights in this case, or this is the way it's thought of, as the Prophet ﷺ and Ali ﷺ, in the terms of what he said, whose mawla I am, Ali is his mawla. For us as Sufi people, Ali is our mawla. There are two, two turuk, one which is uwais, who uh, take their teaching from Siddhna Uwais, Rani Lao Ta'ala Anhu, and Naqshbandi, who take their teachings from Abu Bakr, uh, from the time that he was in the cave, uh, Rani Lao Ta'ala Anhu, on the way uh, to making Hijra, and had to do with uh, when the Prophet taught him the secrets of the dhikr and everything like that, the silent dhikr. So their way is a different way. But our way traces itself back to Ali, who is, as he said also, he says, Ana Medina tal ilm wa Ali Babuha. I am the city of knowledge, and Ali is the gate to that. And he also, Allah said, enter houses by their doors. So we enter the house of knowledge, that is the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, through the door of Ali. That's, that's this line that we belong to. And he spent those years when Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman were running the community and doing what they did and all of what they did. This is, he taught, and this is the way he taught, and what, the way we do and what we do and how we do is the best we know how is what he did. We try to continue his way in this world. And of course, uh, uh, Hassan, his uh, grandson, his oldest grandson, uh, during the years when he reached a, uh, a kind of uh, understanding with Muawiyah, uh, he continued this teaching like this as well. So we know that that, that, that there was another uh, period of time in which this, so it's a long period of time in which this teaching has uh, taken place and gone on from generation to generation to generation. And all of us are linked to him by direct link. That when you make a bayat, in, in you make your bayat with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but your hand is in the hand of the person whose hand is in the hand of the hand of the hand of the hand, and all the way goes back to Ali, whose hand is in the hand of the Prophet Allah, this is one, one line of transmission, direct line of transmission. There are other things you can read books, you can do things, you can see CV, CDs or DVDs or, or meet with people or go to hear Sheikh's talk or so on and so forth. That's a whole other thing. But this thing, that's the contact, the direct link. So. I want to talk here about this this time about the confluence of these two lights, and and also to say a few words about her function as the fountain of Al Kawthar, and the the fountain of plentitude, the fountain of of 
Kathir. Kothar is from Kathara. In Arabic, Kathara means abundance. Early on, I mentioned in these talks some of the names of Fatima Zahra, and there are many more than that of those than the nine that I mentioned, which are the most common ones, which are based on hadith, which you can find easily, both Sunni and Shi'i. And it is likewise reported also in the Sunni hadith on the authority of Anas ibn Malik, who heard Umm Sulaim, the mother of Abu Talha al-Ansari, say, Fatima never experienced the blood of menstruation or parturition, for she was created from the waters of the garden. This is a Sahih Hadith. And it's also reported in the Shi Hadith that the sixth Imam, Jafar Sadiq, said, Fatima has nine names with Allah. They are Fatima as Siddiqa, the righteous, Fatima Mubaraka, the blessed, Atahira, the pure, Azakia, the unblemished, Aradia, the one who is content with the pleasure of Allah, Mardia, the one who is pleasing to Allah, and Muhaditha, the one who is spoken to by angels, and Zahra, the luminous. And in the Musnad of the eighth Imam, Ali Reza, salam, it is reported that the Prophet said, I called my daughter Fatima, the weaned one, that's what it means, because Allah weaned her and those who love her from the fire. And the Prophet also called her Batul, the pure virgin, and said to Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, O Humaira, that was her nickname for her, because she had red hair, a little redhead, uh, Fatima is not like the women of humankind. She does not suffer the condition that you women suffer. That is explained in another prophetic tradition which I've mentioned, which is that she never menstruated. This is a part of her being. So now you can look at all of these names, and you can see just a list of names. Or you can understand that this was a key to understanding who she is. You get know, all kids have nicknames and so on and so forth. You know, this is the way it is. But if you look closely at these names, something else begins to emerge when you consider that these are the names that the Prophet ﷺ called his daughter. He called, them by the, he called her by these names. And since he himself, he never used words loosely. You know, and what he said, he, he, he was very careful with what he said, so what he said had meaning. Because he was known, as you know, his name, nickname, most known nickname is Al-Amin, yani, or the truthful one. And so we have to look closely at these names that maybe that they're more than just a nickname, what's called a kunya. Abu Muhammad Ordoni in his book Fatima the Gracious writes, naming newborn children is considered the principal divine rule. Allah named Adam and Hawa the first day he created them, alayhi wa sallam, and he also taught in Adam all of the names. And so people have followed this rule and they have practiced this idea of naming because we all have names. I read of a tribe in Africa that was very, very deep in Africa and they didn't know anybody else and there were only about 70 or 80 of these people. And they believed that when you died, you came back nine months later. And so they have names like, oh, you again? Oh, we heard from you last time. Uh, not again. You know, because they, this was their belief. They, they believe that people just keep coming and coming and coming. So all people have this thing everywhere you go in the world of names. Everybody has a name. Which when you think about it is quite something. So naming children is really an essential rule for civilized people. And people's names vary according to different times and generations and languages and there may also be a relationship between the name and its meaning, but that's not always true. Thus, some names can be derived from entities other than lingual material. Nevertheless, the people, the advocates of the Deen of Allah gave names of special importance. And this practice has a significant meaning for a human being to be called by his name, hence a good name or a bad name leaves its effect on the holder. 
Indeed, there's a special importance in good names, and it is noteworthy that we should mention here that when Imran's wife gave birth to a daughter, she said, I call you Maryam. Furthermore, Allah chose the name for his prophet Yahya, which had never been used before, before he was conceived. And Allah says that Zechariah, alayhi salam, the father of Yahya, alayhi salam, said, Give me an heir from your presence. And Allah says, one, and then he went on to say, One that will represent me and represent the posterity of Yaqub, because that's the family he was from, from Ben Israel, Yaqub, alayhi salam and make him, O my Lord, one with whom you are well pleased. And his prayers were answered in this, and we find this in Surat Maryam, O Zachariah, we give you the good news of a son, and his name shall be Yahya. And no one by that name have we ever conferred distinction before. So Allah himself named the son of Zachariah, Yahya. And this comes from Hayya, from life, and many other things of his meaning of his name. And it is clear from Allah saying, no one by that name have we conferred before, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigns the names of his special worshippers, such as the prophets and the imams and those who are close to him in place of their parents. That's where the name comes from, like Muhammad. So if you look at many different hadith, which we have to do to make this paper, in discussing the meaning and uh, the naming of Fatima al Zahra, plus the reason for giving her this name, then also that the name was given to her because of certain incitements, not offhand, not as a result of admiring or preferring such a name or, uh, or like this, but because that is who she was. She was Fatima the Radiant. She was Fatima the Bright Star. She was Fatima, the morning star, the daughter of the Prophet, as a secret. She is the hujat of her husband. She is the authority or the proof of her husband, Ali salam. In other words, it is she, and you have to think very deeply on this, and the young people may not understand it, but you older people think about this very carefully. She establishes the esoteric or the internal sense of his knowledge. And Ali's knowledge is through Fatima, and we'll speak more about that. And he guides those who attain to it. So through her perfume, we breathe paradise. Through her perfume, we breathe paradise. Though she was his daughter, the Prophet called her his mother, Umm al Abiha. Ask yourself, think deeply upon this. Let this be with you for the rest of your life. What mystery was the Prophet وسلم, hinting at by calling her this? Well, Fatima Zahra was, in reality, the daughter of the Prophet. وسلم, it was and is Muhammad. That was her father. But he also understood that his own knowledge was bestowed upon him by this divine feminine grace, by this perfume. Think deeply about this. Fatima, in truth, alayhi salam, the real Fatima, like when the Prophet, the Prophet, we know Prophet Muhammad. Ibn Abdullah, the son of Amina and Abdullah, was born in, in a certain place at a certain time, lived a certain time, and he walked in the world, and he died, and we know, we know all that, but we also know that he says that he was a prophet before Adam was between clay and water. Before Adam even existed, Muhammad existed. Jibreel once saw him when he was making tawaf, and he says, Oh, I have seen you for thousands of years, Muhammad, making uh, tawaf. And he says to him, I was making tawaf, Jibreel, before you were here. Before there was a Jibreel, I was. Think about what this means, of who he is in reality. Because you see the outward form of him, but there's an internal 
reality to the Prophet and to, of course, this person Fatima, to all people in truth. So what we could say is that his knowledge was bestowed upon him from there that so that Fatima, in reality, is the esoteric representative in this world of the mercy, of the generosity, and the compassion of Allah. That's who she is. That relieves human beings, that, that she is the representative of Allah's name, Al-Jamal. <laughs> that relieves the human beings from the rigor and the power and the severity, yani the Jalal of Allah. Allah. Esoterically, we could say that if it were not for Fatima, alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not really have sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa oh, sallam no. and the Quran to humanity. Because mm -hmm. Allah has a Jalal side and a Jamal side. The aspect of power and majesty and pure, unalloyed kindness, generosity and mercy. These two came together in him as Kamal oh, no. or perfection. Jalal is the masculine aspect and is overpowering, like the way thunder is, like the way when Musa asked that he want to see Allah, I want to see Allah, I want to see Allah, Allah says, you can't see me. He says, I want to see you. He says, like, you can't see me. I want to see you. He says, okay, all right. Look at this mountain over here, Musa. Oh, like this again. Musa Saika. Allah says in Quran, Musa Saika. I mean, he was thunderstruck because Allah showed him the mountain was blown away in one second. A mountain just like this, completely blown away. This he showed to him, you want to see me? Look at the mountain. So what did he show him? He showed him that, that Jalal sign. So this is the masculine aspect and it's overpowering in truth. And Jamal is the feminine aspect, which is loving, which is kind and which is beautiful. Jalal and Jamal, majesty and beauty, strength and grace, whatever you want to say, however you want to understand that, are also known as two other names, Adal and Fadal. Adal meaning justice. Justice is rigorous. Justice is, is adamant, adamant. And Jamal, beauty. Also, it's called Ghadab and Rahma, wrath and mercy, or Qahar and Lutf, severity and gentleness. All of these, these, these things. This refers to that majesty, the revelation of which burns and consumes the worlds is in one aspect both rigorous and severe, but beauty, on the other hand, is the synthesis of mercy, of generosity, and of compassion, and all similar and like qualities. If for no other reason than that, the Prophet said, Fatima is the mother of her fathers. Think deeply. The Prophet said also, he said about her, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fatima is part of me, and I am part of her. Whoever harms her, harms me. Whoever harms me, angers Allah. He also said, whoever angers her, angers me, and whoever satisfies her, satisfies me. And he also said, Allah becomes angry for her anger, and satisfied by her satisfaction. So we find that Sayyida Fatima is not only a part of the Messenger وسلم, but the Messenger وسلم, is part of her. Look, look deeply to this. Because both of them are part of the message of Allah. Hmm? As is her husband Ali وسلم, and her two sons وسلم, because the Prophet said in the Hadith of the cloak in the Hadith Al-Qisa, al al they are from me and I am from them. In an equally known Hadith, he says, 
Hussein is from me, and I am from Hussein. We have this here that Sayyid Jalali said this. We have that, that, that uh, thing here. I am from me, uh, Hassan, Hussein is from me, and I am from Hussein. If you visit the maqam of Sidna Hussein in Cairo, you'll find it written there. Hassan Mini wa Ana Min Hussein. So in all of this, but all of this, it is Fatima who is the fulcrum, getting the thing in which everything, you know, like when you have a teeter-totter and, and it goes like this, you have to have that thing, that, that thing in the mentor, again, like we're saying, we're the people of the center. Think back when I said the beginning and the early, we're the thing in the center. She's the mother of her father. She's the daughter of her father. She's the wife of his legatee, of whom the Prophet said, I and Ali are the father and the mother of this community. <laughs> and the mother of his grandsons, one of whom the Prophet ﷺ says that he is from me and I am from him. So you see, these things are really one interlinked thing. All of this together is one thing. All of this is one thing. This is one being. And you're seeing the different when you talk about the Prophet, when you talk about Ali, when you talk about Fatima, when you talk about Hassan, and when you talk about Hussein, you're talking about one being in reality, with five different faces, if you like. No. Or five different aspects, or five different realities. But one being, five aspects of the same being. And in a strange way, everything in this manner is very closely tied to this hadith al kisa to the, the to the cloak, the thing. Because what happens when you put the cloak over all of five of them? They disappear. If I take five people and I put a cloak over them, where can you say where's one and where's the other? Well, they may know inside, inside, but outside, what do you see? One thing. Huh? One thing. Fatima salam, reported that Ali salam, said to my father, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Ya Rasulullah, what significance has Allah given for getting us all together underneath this cloak? Uh, he wanted to know, why, why are we doing this? What's it about? He, has, he knows, of course, what it's about, but that's how we learn what it's about. Huh? by their asking questions. So the Prophet ﷺ said, The desire of Allah is to remove all the faults from you, O people of the household, and to purify you with the perfect purification by Him who has appointed me a prophet, chosen me to be a messenger for the salvation of humanity, whenever and wherever an assembly of our followers and friends mention this event, Allah will bestow upon them His blessings and mercy, the angels will come and encircle them as he is to, as they are tonight, asking Allah for the remission of all of their sins until all of these people here disperse. Surely I have not created the sky. I have not stretched forth the earth. I have not illuminated the moon and the bright sun and the rotating planets, the flowing seas and the sailing ships, but for the love of these five who are sitting underneath this cloak. <laughs> for surely the awliya of Allah, the friends of Allah, no fear upon them, nor shall they grieve. And those were the people under the cloak. There shall remain nobody grieved, but Allah will remove that grief. There shall be nobody distressed, but Allah will dispel that distress. There shall be remain no wish seeker, but Allah will grant them their wish. Kayfa takfuruna billahi wa kuntum amwatun fa ahyakum thumma yumitukum thumma yuhyikum thumma ilayhi turjaun. When you were dead, He gave you life. He will make you die, and He will give you life again. And you will be returned to him, Allah says in Surah Baqarah. Man amana billahi wa yawm al-akhiri wa amila salahan falahum ajrun inda rabbihim wa la khawfan alayhim wa lahum yahsanun. All people who have 
iman in Allah in the last day and act rightly, they shall have their reward with their Lord, and they shall fear no fear, and they will know no sorrow. What draws, what draws people to the family? Some people are drawn. I have always been drawn to the family. When I first heard about them, I was doing a retreat on a beach someplace. I don't know what I was doing. And I came across a book called Payambar, The Messenger. And I first read about these people. I said, Allah, what wonderful people these are. I loved them from the beginning. When I first heard about them, I loved them. I didn't know. What do I know? I don't know. I'm a Christian boy, born in America, grown up in America, you know, studying this subject, this subject, and this subject, trying to find the thing. I don't know like this. But when I heard about this family, I felt very attracted to them. Deeply, deeply, deeply attracted to them. Deeply. So what draws people? Some people are not drawn to the family. They're not drawn to the family. They have their friends among the Ashab, and they have this, and they have that. That's the, they don't have. But a few people in every generation have this love of this family. And they are all different kinds of people from all different kinds of places. It's not an issue like what people thought last night when they were arguing about the political inheritance of the Prophet. That's not what we're talking about here, friends. It's the deeper esoteric sense of the prophethood and the wilayat that was pulsing within those people. Wilayat is the amplification of prophethood. Because just as when we say Muhammad Khatam al-Anbiya, he's the seal of the prophets, just as he seals prophecy, he opens the door of wilayat. Just as he brings an end to something, there is no prophet after Muhammad. From the time of Adam to Muhammad, it's finished. That's it. There isn't going to be somebody else. There isn't anybody else. That's closed. But what is open is the world of initiation, the world of spiritual mastery, the world of spiritual authority, which he opened us up for, or opened the door for us to come into when he said, Yani, Ana ilm medinat al ilm. How to get to it? This is the way to get to it. Wilayat is an amplification of prophethood. It is a more interiorized complement of prophethood, of Nabuwa, which serves to explain what is otherwise a series of narratives, a gathering of divine descriptions of do this and don't do that, which is what most people take religion to be. Do what you do and what you don't do. This gives you a whole other dimension. It says, "Ma kana Muhammadan abba ahadi min rijalikum wa lakin Rasulullah wa khatam nabiyyin wa kana Allah bi kulli shay'in alim." Muhammad's not the father of any of you men, but he's the messenger of Allah and he's the seal of the prophets and he has knowledge Allah has knowledge of all things. And we need to define here a few words when we say khatam a nabuwa, or the seal of the prophecy, it is derived from the Quranic phrase, khatam al the seal of the prophets, is in the ayat that I just read. For instance, if we say, khatam al-kitab, it means uh, the letter has been enclosed in an envelope, like, uh, I don't know, like these envelopes here, and sealed. It's a finely secured. I write the letter, and I put it in the envelope, and then... I, I closed it and I, I lick it and like that I say in Arabic khatam al khitab it means the letter has been enclosed and sealed khatam al qalb means the heart has been sealed so they can't perceive anything new or can it ever anything which it has already taken or khatam al awliya the seal of the friends of Allah or the seal of the masters which is a title that was bestowed upon Ali by the Prophet Allah <laughs> means the end and the case of everything denotes its doom and its ultimate finish. <laughs> to end the thing means to carry it to its ultimate limit. So this term, Khatam <laughs> al-Qur'an, is used in a similar sense, the sealing, the closing verses of the Qur'an. 
So for this reason, all the people, ling linguist people and commentaries agree that Chatam and Nebi'in means that the last in the line of the prophets or the last in the final prophet, and there is no other prophecy or prophets after him. So Chatam, well, if you want to look in the official thing of the logo of Arabia, in its linguistic usage, it doesn't refer to the post office stamp, which is affixed on the outgoing mail, but it is the seal which is put on the envelope to secure its contents. Simply put, after Muhammad, there are no other prophets, there is no other prophecy, meaning that Allah has ceased to send revelation in the form of a diwani revelation, re revelation, that is a written revelation. There is no more to that. So you say, okay, all right, all right, I get all this, you got to all this, and what does it mean? Functionally, it means that while we may have something, which is the written Quran, this, this book that's here, we have this written Quran, we don't really know, a lot of us, what it means. We don't know what it means. We, we read it, but we don't know what it means. And in order to know what it means, we have to have someone who can explain to us in a way we can understand it, so we can make use of it in our lives. Otherwise, we don't, what can we do with it? It's just a book. What can we do with it? <laughs> Those who pledge you their allegiance pledge allegiance to Allah, and the hand of Allah is above their hands. So, while most of us have some idea of Nubuah, we can understand this book, we read this book every day, we, we, we're in a, an order which we read at least maybe almost two hours a day, we all are, everybody in this room just about is doing that, I mean of the older people, and the children are learning, alhamdulillah. We need to more, know more about what this thing is of Walaya, that is this spiritual authority. And more and deeper than that, we need to understand that Fatima, Fatima Azahra, Majmu Nurain, is the one who mediates between these two worlds. She's, she's in the middle between these two worlds, between Nubuwa and Walaya, her father and her husband. She is the one who is between them, the mother of their, the daughter of her, and the husband of her, and also the mother of these two, which we all inherit from. And if we look at this term of wilayat, which means primacy, or guide, or lordship, and words related to spiritual authority, even to temporal power, like when the Turks had their empire, they would call this was the wilayat of Egypt, this was the wilayat of Iraq, or this was the wilayat of Basra, this was the wilayat of Baghdad, and so on and so on and so forth like that. It also means, it talks about a form of political power. The idea of a unified government, Willa, Wilaya, Wilaya, Wali, Maula, all of these things are coming from this thing, Wala, Wow, Lem, Aleph, Maksura, which has the primary meaning. What does it mean when you get down and you cut everything away? Because everything in Arabic is this trilateral root, and from this trilateral root, 126 words can grow from this root. What does this root really mean? It means being close, from which is derived to be in front of, which is derived the meanings of government, because the government is in front, or the government is the temporal, or the government, or the governor is the, the leader, or in the spiritual sense, the power of the political sense of the words, the master, the leader, the chosen in the spiritual sense. The same root gives place to a series of words which denote power, authority, being close to the center, the wasit that we mentioned earlier, of sovereignty, which also include mediation and intercession, or to wasit. So, this is what Fatima Azahra, alayhi salam, mediates. She is the barzakh between these two rivers of life, or of light, that of prophecy, as the mother of her father, and that of mastery, as the wife of the one who was the maula of the master, and who was the master was the mola of his inheritor. And here you can see eyebrows being raised, but you have to think what he says. Yaddallahi fawka aidihim. Sunni, she, for me, I don't care. Both of these words are from the politics of division. 
I only ask you to ask yourself what Ali was doing for those 24 years or so like that and where this school came from and how we came to be, how I came to be and why all the lines of transmission trace, except these ones I mentioned, the Uwais and the Naqshbandi, trace their way back to Ali. And even the Naqshbandi have a relation to it because they're related to the, the granddaughter of Abu Bakr who married to Jafar, a Sadiq, and they find a way to trace back again through that way to them too. So that they in truth also trace their way back to it. You ask, where does this Sufism come from? How did it come to be? Why all of these lines trace back? Because you just have to ask those who are firmly rooted in knowledge, those who are in authority, Ati Allah wa Ati Rasul wa Ati Umar those who are in authority among you. These are the people you obey, really. And who is our mother in truth in all of this, as well as what is the reality? And to understand the crucial use of the word, those in authority from amongst you. Those in authority from amongst you. Ya you aladina amanu ati Allah wa ati rasula wa ulil amri minkum. O you who believe, obey Allah, obey the messenger, and obey those in authority from amongst you. Indeed, it became crucial after the death of the Prophet to know who were Ulid Amr Minkum, who were the people in authority amongst you. And for this reason it is said behind the hadith regarding the division of Islam into 73 sects, and it's precipitated by misunderstanding or not understanding this critical ayah. Among the philosophers and the scholars are those who say that it is they who are ulil amr by dint of their superior knowledge, especially among the uh, what we call the uh, pious law clerks or the ulama or fuqaha. Indeed, a well-known scholar, Dr. Taha al-Alwani, says, those in authority among you are the scholars who are able to deduce judgments and leaders entrusted by the Ummah who have authority regarding the Sharia of Allah and stick to it without falsification. That's in one of his books. Sunnis point to the righteous Khulafa, but truthfully it's hard to understand who are their successors. Who are their successors? For instance, in immediate terms then you would have to think of Muawiyah to be among the Ulid Amr, and then Okay, maybe you could see some things in it, but then Yazid? Certainly, you cannot think that these are the immediate technical successors, but how about the Khulafa and the Ottoman Empire, the Devlet Osmania, or the times of the Mughal, or the Mamluk history of in Islamic history and the corruption and all things that took place in the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, the term Mawla had the connotation of spiritual authority and universal temporal power. And the basis of any caliphate or true government is the transcendence of its foundation, the very basis of its sovereignty, of its authority, of its legitimacy, and however, with the downfall of effective power in the succession of the caliphate, starting with Abu Bakr, the term Khalifa suffered from it. So you, after the four rightly guided caliphs, the caliphate ceased to have any connotation of sovereignty and effect to admit the sense of effective authority. And then you can talk about Muawiyah, you can talk about the Umayyad dynasty, you can, who considered himself to be the first king of Islam when Allah says of himself, who a Malik al-Mulk. He is responsible for losing the effective spiritual authority and diminishing the meaning so that many titles, like now in, in Egypt, they, they, they call the cab driver Ya Reis, O President. <laughs> Everything has become, has no meaning anymore. So the very term Khalif, which, which used to be, came now, come so diluted that any governor of any Islamic fiefdom would be claimed to be the Khalif of his own uh, petty domain. And so the name was lost in having any meaning. Among the Shia, on the other hand, Imam Jafar made, uh, 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 made repeated unequivocal declaration concerning the nature of the Imam. 
and he proclaimed in a very forthright manner that the Imams are the Hujjah of Allah on the earth, and their words are the words of Allah, and their commands are the commands of Allah, and obedience to them is obedience to Allah, and disobedience to them is disobedience to Allah. And all their decisions are inspired by Allah, and they have absolute authority. And it is to them, therefore, that Allah has ordained obedience. And he goes on to declare that the Imam of the time is the witness for the people, and the gate to Allah, the Bab Allah, and the road Sabil to Allah, and the guide thereto, and the repository of his knowledge, the interpreter of his revelations, and the Imam of his time is the pillar of the unity of Allah, and the Imam is immune from sin and error. But where are the Imams today? Where do you go to find them? He's in occlusion. It's very hard to get something from somebody who's in occlusion. So the Imams are those from whom Allah has removed all their purities, made them pure, but the problem was and is, where do you find them? If you're told to obey them, how can you obey them if you can't find them? So the Sunnis and the Shi'is are both, unfortunately, caught in the same problem. It doesn't exist. What they're talking about no longer exists for them. Or it exists in, in an occulted form which you can't find. So, there are many theological and metaphysical workarounds which have been devised or suggested over the centuries, but the, century, but the bottom line remains for the Shia that there has been and there is no possibility for them of direct contact with the Imam. So they are left following scholars, just the same, or what we could call pious law clerks, because we don't have any priests in Islam, whether we're Shi or Sunni, just the same as the Sunnis do. They follow some marjia, and this he's a follower of some other one, and so on and so forth like that, and that's what they're following. So this puts them into exactly the same position as the Sunnis, in having to rely upon qualified scholars to get crucial answers to critical questions when we are faced with in this world and the next world, a crucial part of the problem is that many of these scholars have been and are corrupt in one way or another. And we see that when we see Mubarak sitting there and we see on one side of him the Sheikh of, of, of Azhar and the other side the Mufti of, of, of Egypt and they both know that this man is a murderer. He's a murderer. And this happens in Iran, which advises itself as the Islamic Republic. This happens in Saudi Arabia. The hidden Imam, he can't tell you anything any more than anybody else can tell you anything. Hmm? He can't tell you anything. Because he has no contact with the thing. And when Allah says, nothing contains me but the heart of the mu'min, that means, and he says in Quran, Huwa ma'akum aina makuntum, he is with you wherever you are. That means it is possible that Allah is inside of you and you must be in contact with that because if you aren't in contact with that, you're not in contact with anything. True. Just in process. Maybe you'll make it, maybe you won't. Allah help you. But by the grace of Allah, there are people who have and are and in contact with that. And it could be anywhere in the world at any time, in any place, and anywhere. Hmm? So, recall what I said earlier. Ana Madinat al ilm wa ali babuha. La ahada yud kilal bayt illa min khilalu bawaba. I am the city of knowledge. Ali is its gate, and one does not enter the house except through the gate. Enter houses by their doors and be aware of Allah so that hopefully you will be successful. Mm -hmm. And recall that the founder and the principal exponent of this school is based on the practice and thought of the Prophet ﷺ was Imam Ali, who was uncontestably the Imam par excellence in time. Reaching to the end now. Look at all these many lines of transmission. There are Sufi schools all over the world by which this teaching was passed down 
through generation after generation, and you will inevitably find Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, and Hassan al Basri, of whom Ali said, Huwa min al Bayt, just the way his grandfather said about Sidi Salman, Huwa min al Bayt. And if you look further down through the first generation, you will find all of the Imams down to Jafar Sadiq, alayhi salam, plus many distinguished members of the Salaf and Tabayun. So there's no question of heterodoxy. Sunni, Shi'i, and all of this thing. These are the best of the best. Forget those names. If you look at the links in the transmission, you find one after another after another of people of the highest character and learning. And especially if you look at the shayuk of these schools and the helms of these ships of safety, these Safinat and Najah, you will see 70 now, now some 70 generations of the best of the best from among the Muslim community. Are there bad apples? Are there placeholders? Are there this? Are there shopkeepers, peers, and that? Of course there are. Just as much as the ulama, our own, there are Sufi sheikhs and Sufi peers and all that who are owned in the same way by their, by their whatever they're thinking about themselves and so on and so on and so forth. Like, that is not who we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who is in contact with the hidden imam and speaks from that place. That's what we're talking about. And that's why I say, in the old days, people will travel thousands of miles to find one hadith. Today, you have to travel thousands of miles to find one person who is in contact with that hidden imam. Allah. If you don't find that, you don't find anything. No matter, he's got thousands of followers in a big place and flags and things sticking off his head and pink roses on him and all of these things. That means nothing. My sheikh told me, look in the back of the masjid, some old guy sitting in the back of the masjid with his beads like that. Go look for him. That's where you're going to find him. Don't look for the glory and the glitz and all that stuff. That's not where it is. That's not where it's at. What we say, those who show, don't know. Those who know, don't show. Understand that. And this place is the maqam of Fatima Zahra, and her grave is hidden. Understand that, it's hidden. Her maqam is hidden. Nobody knows where to go and find the maqam of Sayyidah Fatima and pray. They don't know, except those who know. Mm. It is at the confluence, it is at the juncture of the Nubuwa and the Walayat where she is. And this is the intimate connection with the source of ongoing authority because she's the father, she's the mother of her father. So when you look deeply into this, it appears on the surface that most of us trace our heritage back to Ali, but in reality and at a deeper level, we trace our lineage back to Fatima. She is the bridge. She is the barzakh. She is the mother of her father. She is the wife of her true manifest wali and our mawla. For as much as the holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam terminated the cycle of prophecy and nubuwa, he opened for us the cycle of initiation and the spiritual authority. One might say that it is the pure Sophic dimension of Sufism and metaphysically authentic in a way that some orders who profess to look back to Maryam as a source for their Sufic reality can never be and never understand. In essence, we are the Fatimiyun, and this is our Sophiology, which is to say our wisdom teachings derive in essence and substance from the very being, heart, and soul of Fatima Zahra. She is our mother, just as does the authority of the Qutb and the Ghauth and the Nukaba and the Autad and the Abrar and the Abdal and the Akhyar and the 4,000 hidden saints all in the end derive their position of authority and station from her. And all, all in the end are informed 
to her sapiential <coughs> wisdom. Wallahu alam wa fatiha. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Rahman Rahim Imanik Yom Adin Iyaka Nabudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ihidina Sirat Al-Mustaqeen Sirat Al-Adina Nam Ta'alayhim Ghayri Al-Mantubi Alayhim Al-Adolim Amin Alhamdulillah Allah Akbar